So there's a lot of stuff going on on this picture I, I recognize. But let me kind of talk through it a little bit. We have a little rolling cart. That little rolling cart has some big wheels in the back, some smaller wheels in the front. Um, the position that we see it in right there is the position where the torsional spring that is attached to the axle that drives the rear wheels. It's the position where that spring has no torque in it. So that torsion spring at the position you see right here is totally relaxed. Okay. The other thing I'll say about that right now is that uh, as with many sort of wind up car toys that you see, there is a clutch between the uh, spring that drives those back wheels such that it maintains a connection between the spring and the axle uh, when, like when you try to push the cart back, for instance, it's going to wind up the spring. But if you drive the car forward, there's a clutch that won't basically make you drive the spring the opposite direction. You all know what I'm talking about? If you played with like a wind up car toy, they always, if you pull them backward, they wind up the spring. And if you let them go forward, it lets the spring out, right? But they, it won't like try to wind up the spring again when it reaches the end of the amount of spring. It just has a little clutch in there that allows it to coast however much further it wants to go. Okay, so we have that here. So in other words, if it rolls forward from the position it's shown at right now, it's like the spring, that torsion spring disengages. Okay. All right. Um, there are two rear wheels. Each of them are four kilograms. There's two front wheels. Each of them are one kilogram. The cart itself weighs three kilograms. Okay. The whole thing is set up on an eight degree slope, eight degrees from horizontal. All right, um, what we're going to do is we are going to apply some force to this body and we're going to push it for 10 centimeters of motion. That would be in the direction of D that I'm showing up there. We're going to push it for 10 centimeters of motion and we want to push it hard enough so that the cart, uh, when it, when it uh, passes the position it's in, shown in right now, so that you're pushing it down the hill you're going to push it for 10 centimeters and then you're going to let go of it. You want for that to create uh, enough energy so that the, the whole cart has a speed of two meters per second when it comes back to the position it started in. All right. Um, so that's actually the first thing is how much is your maximum backward travel that you would need so that you end up with two meters per second um, with, uh, you know, that's the velocity of it when it gets back to its starting place. The second part of the problem is going to be how hard did you need to push in the orientation that we're showing up there to make that happen. And then lastly, um, after it goes past the point where it started, it's going to keep on riding up the hill until it hits that bumper spring. My last question is, What's the maximum uh, amount of compression? That'd be a little delta shown up there. What's the maximum compression that that spring experiences once the whole cart reaches all the way up to the top up there? Okay, now, before I actually start solving this problem, um, how would you like to have to do this problem if you were using Newton's second law only? All right. This would be a <laughs> this would be a mess. This would not be a problem that I would prefer to have to solve that way. Which is really nice that we now have this idea that we can use a conservation of energy approach and say if we can just account for where all the energy goes, there are statements we can make about some of the quantities that are associated with the problem, some of the things that we want to know. Okay. All right. Before we really get into all of that, though, as is often the case with these kinds of problems, there is some preliminary stuff that we need to do. One of the things that we're going to need to know is what is the uh, moment of inertia of the back axle. Okay, so let's maybe I'll just put down here preliminary calculations. And I want to know what is my moment of inertia of the back axle. OK. 
Okay. How do I do that? Well, I've got two wheels back there, right? So let me first just say whatever I come up with, let me multiply it by two. All right? Because they're both going to be operating in conjunction with one another. Okay? In case you don't remember what the formula is for the moment of inertia of a disk, because it says right here the wheels can be treated as uniform disks, um, you can look that up in the back of the book. So it's got around the center axis through a disk, it says it's going to be one half mr squared. Okay? So we have one half, the, the mass of the back wheels are, is four kilograms. and the radius is going to be 10 centimeters. Okay. I would actually say uh, that it kind of depends on where you're going with it. Um, probably safest to get yourself into base units, right? That's uh, a method that seldom leaves you hanging, okay? so. We'll say down here, we can convert this by saying there are 100, um, well, we'll say there's 100 centimeters in a meter. Okay. And because this is 1 half mr squared, that's going to be squared right there. Okay. So. 2 times 1 half, just, that just cancels, right? So I have 4 times 10 over 100 squared, which gives me 0 0.04. This would be in kilogram meters squared, okay? Same idea for the front wheels. The only difference is their mass, and they also have a different radius. There's two centimeter radius for those front wheels. Okay, I'll multiply by a meter per 100 centimeters. That will be squared. And so this ends up giving us just two over 100 squared. Okay. By the way, if any of you use this calculator and you don't like seeing um, scientific notation like this, you'd rather just have it express it as a decimal. There's a nice little technique. You can use this ENG key right here. Um, hitting it actually moves it the direction I wouldn't prefer. Um, but if you do shift, it goes the other direction. Right? You can get it back to being just a number rather than something expressed in uh, scientific notation. All right, so 0 0.0004 kilogram meter squared. The three kilograms is referring to the entire thing, like the entire chassis, let's say, of the cart. Okay, so the three kilograms is not rotating. So we don't need to know what its moment of inertia is, right? Three kilograms basically refers to all of this stuff right here. Does that make sense? All right. That's actually another thing that we're going to want to do is figure out what is my overall mass. Okay. Well, I'll just have to add up everything. So I have two times four kilograms because there's two of those wheels. There's also two times one kilogram, because there's two of the front wheels. There's also the mass of the cart. Okay, so here's eight plus two is 10 plus three is 13 kilograms. All right, so those are a few of the preliminary calculations I want to do. Let me actually do one other one as well, because there is a really, really powerful piece of information that is given, and it's going to be the basis for a lot of our other calculations. And it is um, basically how much energy is associated with the 
position after you've pushed it back and it's come forward, we can very quickly come up with how much energy is associated with that particular velocity, two meter per second. Does that make sense? It's like we can, we can figure out in an absolute sense how much energy is associated with that velocity of the cart at that position, okay? But to get that, we probably need to relate the angular speed of the wheels to the linear speed of the cart. Well, how do you do that? So in other words, let's say omega b, when the cart is at that, you know, position where it started, but after it's been given this energy to be able to have its speed. Um, to do that, you basically just take that velocity of two meters per second. How do I get that into an angular velocity, would you say? Probably need to divide it by the radius uh, of the part that's rotating, right? Those are the kinematic equations we learned earlier. So we divide this by 10 centimeters. Okay, now since I have meters and centimeters there, I probably want to take this and multiply it by, let's say, a meter per 100 centimeters, something like this. Okay, so to calculate that, that's basically 2 times 100 divided by 10, which gives me 20. Okay, 20 what? Okay, 20 times 1 over seconds, what does that kind of tend to tell you? Probably radians per second. All right. Well, what about the angular speed of the front? Okay, same idea. We still have a linear speed of two meters per second, but then we have to take and figure out what the angular speed is. And to do that, again, you divide by radius. So you divide by two centimeters. Keep in mind, you wanna probably do that conversion from centimeters to meters, like so, okay? And when you do this, that ends up just giving you 100 radians per second. All right, so now what we're gonna do is figure out how much energy um, at starting position after wind up and let go. Okay, so in other words, it's been pushed back and now it's gonna come upward. How much energy are we talking about? Okay. And I don't need to know anything else. I know everything that I need to know because the only form of energy that I have at that point is just kinetic energy. Because I'm gonna take that as my zero, I'm gonna say this is basically zero uh, energy change due to you know, height, you know, gravity, right? Due to height change. I'm gonna call that my zero position. So I'll just figure out what is my energy at the starting position due to, you know, after you wind up and let go to have that two meter per second speed. Well, to get that, I just do one half of the total mass, 13 kilograms, times what, you think? Probably times two meter per second squared. So, so far, that gives me how much energy I have for the cart that's associated with just the idea that the whole cart is translating, okay? But I actually have more energy than that because some of the cart is not just translating, some of the cart is also rotating, right? And there's energy associated with that as well. So I have to add to this one half of the moment of inertia for the back axle times, okay, the angular velocity of the back axle 
squared. What do you think I'm going to add to this? Because I just dealt with the back axle, right? I'm going to add 1 half of the moment of inertia of the front axle times the angular velocity of the front axle squared. Okay. And this is my kinetic energy that I have uh, right here at this point in time. So you imagine you've pushed it backward, you let go of it, it probably had some, you know, some speed at that point. So after you stop pushing, it's going to keep going backward until uh, you reach some other position and then it'll start moving forward again. At some point it crosses the position that we showed right at the very beginning and right at that point all of the energy that you have added is in the form of kinetic energy. And that's what we just calculated is how much kinetic energy that really is. All right, so I can actually pull out a one half there because it's in every term. Okay, so one half times, here I've got 13 times two squared plus one half times point 0, 04 times 20 squared plus, okay, the one half is there, so we still have that counted for at the beginning, uh, 0. 0.0004 times 100 squared. And what I'm left with is 36 joules. Okay, so now that's not actually one of the things we were supposed to find, but it's going to be useful in pretty much everything else we do. So I did that as a preliminary calculation so that we would have it. What's the first thing we're supposed to really find? The maximum backward travel distance D needed so that the velocity of the cart is two meters per second when it comes back to its starting position, okay? So there's a couple things that I think is, is good for us to do here. The first thing is write our equation generally. So we're, start, we're dealing with part A, okay? Basically what we're saying here is we're going to have between one state and another, we kind of have to identify our states. One state is when we reach back to our starting position, okay? So that's kind of, I would say that might be our final position, right? What's our initial position? Okay, our initial position was a distance of D backward from that. We don't know what that value is yet, but a distance of D backward from that was our initial position. And based on all those things, we have a few differences, all right? We have a difference in the amount of energy um, due to uh, a height change. Maybe I'll call that gravity, right? Okay. We also have a difference in the amount of energy due to what? Okay, I'll say... Elastic energy, right? What elastic energy do you think I'm talking about? The spring inside the wheel, right? That torsion spring has a difference in the amount of energy uh, from one position to another. What else? Okay, I'll say there's a difference in the amount of kinetic energy. Okay, because when you reach that furthest back distance, how much kinetic energy does it have? All right, it was moving when it, you know, after you gave it a push, it moved backwards. At some point, it stopped and began moving the other way. 
That's a key word. It stopped. Right? So if it stopped, then it's got zero kinetic energy. Right? So at that end of the, of the uh, travel, it's got zero. And then when it gets to the other end of the travel, which is in the position it's shown right now, but now it has velocity, now it has a non-zero kinetic uh, energy when it gets to that point. Okay? Anything else? Any other changes in energy that happen throughout from one state to the other state? I would say probably not. And because um, what we're looking at is not the phase of the problem where we're pushing with a force F, we're looking at the phase of the problem after that. We've already pushed with the force F. It already went back to the position that it was going to get to. And now we're just literally looking at it rolling from that position up to uh, the current position. So that means we got no work happening on it during that time. We just have a difference in forms of energy going from our, you know, elastic energy and uh, moving that energy basically from there to gravity and kinetic energies. Okay. And I think it's a good idea always to identify on here. Uh, we're say we're going from the uh, left position say left most position to original location. All right. So what is our change in energy due to gravity? How do we figure that out? Okay. Yeah, that was that last thing that I showed you. It's basically mg times delta h, right? So basically the question is, how much delta h have we had during this movement from that position backward to the position it's in right now? All right, so um, we don't know what that is absolutely because we're trying to solve for d. All right, that's what we're trying to solve for. But we can express it in terms of d. All right, so what we would do there is we say we have the mass of the whole cart, 13 kilograms, times g, times delta h. Delta h, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll draw like a little triangle right here. What we're saying here is that um, we have moved by D right here. What we're trying to do is figure out what is this delta H. And this right here is 8 degrees. Right? So delta H is just D times the sine of 8 degrees. Okay, and it's positive because we're going from a position lower to a position that's higher. All right, so we have more gravitational energy, so to speak, or sometimes is referred to as potential energy. Right? I don't like that term quite as much because I feel like it's a general, it, you know, it's kind of a catch-all that says there's this potential energy could be due to strain, could be due to whatever. I like thinking of this as as gravitational energy. Right? Um, so that would be positive. What about elastic? Okay, that's due to the unwinding of that torsion spring. So question for you, positive or negative? From the leftmost position to the position we're going to now, is there a positive or negative change in the amount of energy stored in the spring? What would you say? Okay, and I'll give you this. It starts out with energy in it. It ends without energy in it, right? Because when it gets back up to the beginning, all of that energy is back out of the spring again. So if it starts with some and it ends with nothing, then that means you've had a negative change in the amount of energy stored in the spring. OK? 
okay? So you have minus one half of the K for that spring is 30 uh, Newton meters, whoops, Newton meters per radian, okay? Multiplied by what? Okay, well, the, you know, we are dealing with thetas here, movements angularly of this thing, that it goes back to zero uh, at, when we get back to the end of the motion of this thing, right? Right, so all we gotta do is just do a theta squared. Well, we don't have theta directly, but we can relate theta to D. How do we relate theta to D? If theta is the, uh, yeah, if theta is the uh, amount of rotation of the axle of this thing, we just get it as uh, D, okay, divided by the radius of that wheel. And again, we probably want to go to uh, base units. Yeah, it, I, I do kind of think of it that way, but I actually think of all of these things kind of as potential energies. It's energy storage in some form, right? Even kinetic energy can be thought of as energy storage, right? Uh, it's not as bad to envision, you know, it's not hard to envision if you think of it as a flywheel. You can spin up a flywheel and now you've got this energy stored in the fact that you've got this body spinning, right? Right. Well, the, the idea being that we can transform energy from something that's moving to something that has this, this strain energy between bonds of a material to a height change, and any of those can be a way that you can store some energy, right? Work is something where you bring a force in from the outside and you just, like, add some force times distance somehow into something, or a moment times an angle and it's adding some energy that's into the system, you know. Um, that's kind of, at least in my mind, how I divide up the idea of work versus the idea of storing some energy in some way. All right, we're not quite done yet. What's our last element that we have here? So this was, you know, this was gravity. This was elastic energy. And then what's our last one? Kinetic. And fortunately, I, I would have to write all this out if I hadn't already done it in my preliminary calculation. How much uh, change in kinetic energy do I have going from the leftmost position to the original position? Okay. Well, what I would, I, I calculated that a second ago. 36 joules, because I'm going from zero kinetic energy, because it goes to zero velocity when it's at its leftmost position, up to the amount of, of kinetic energy that I'm going for, uh, that I'm saying I need based on what's given in the problem, two meter per second. We've already calculated, said that's 36 joules of energy, right? So I say plus 36 joules, based on the calculation I did a minute ago, and we're saying, if I add all this stuff up, it should be zero, which means I should be able to solve for D. Okay. So, 13 times 9.81 times X times the sine of 8 degrees minus 0.5 times 30 times x over, uh, we'll say 10, I'll put the 100 back up there. And we will square that. Then I'm gonna add 36 joules and set it equal to zero. 
Okay. And what I end up with is 0.16095. meters, or if you want to see that in centimeters, that would be 16.095 centimeters. Okay, so when we do this, we give it a push at the very beginning after we give it a push, it probably continues on until you've gotten all that energy stored into the, uh, into the spring and it reaches its leftmost position. And then it starts to go back up the hill because it's got that energy stored in the spring. And as it passes its original position, um, it has two meters per second worth of uh, kinetic energy in it. All right, so that's part A. That's how far back it ends up traveling. Part B, what's the magnitude of force that we need if we want to achieve that maximum backward distance, which will then achieve two meter per second whenever we get to the uh, beginning position? Okay, how do we do that? Okay. Well, again, let's start with our basic idea. The basic idea is um, that, you know, actually, let me start almost with a statement over here. Let's say that we're going from the initial um, Okay, we'll say we're going from the initial uh, position to the point where F is released. Okay. Do you feel like that's the best way to go about this? This is, um, I'll propose this right at the very beginning and then let's talk about it. So this is, this is one of the ways that we can think about um, this, this problem is we can say we're going to start where we're, you know, right at the very beginning and then we'll go to where F is released. Okay. I'll say, what's the disadvantage of doing it this way? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of pick it out. What all, what all terms would we have? We would have a change in height. We would have a change in elastic energy. We would have a change in kinetic energy, right? All of these things would, would be in our equation. Let me actually back up a, a bit and say, where does the energy come from that gives us the kinetic energy at its initial position? Like once it's gone down and come back up, where is that energy coming from that gives us the two meters per second as it passes its original position? Yeah, it's coming from the force, right? It was started at rest. We pushed on it with a force. It went down, it came back. And uh, all of the energy that we have, when it gets back to that original starting position, all that energy came from the force. So you're saying maybe it'd be better to just do it whenever it's not paid Yeah, so maybe what we want to do is go from uh, the initial position to the initial position as it passes that position again. Okay. So from the initial position back to the initial position. Could you explain uh, for part A, it's going from the leftward position to the original, so that's like from the point he stops winding it back? Yeah, so in other words, what happens here is, um, 
you know, the total amount of distance back it went was d, we are only pushing it through some smaller amount of that with our force of f, right? We're only pushing it through 10 centimeters of distance. And how far did it go back total? 16 centimeters. So in other words, after we stop pushing, like this is 10 centimeters, right? We push it for 10 centimeters, it goes back 10 centimeters, then we release the force, but the fact that it's got some kinetic energy makes it continue to travel until the uh, force in the spring or the torque in the spring overcomes that and reverses the direction, right? So that's what we're talking about there. And I'm saying all of the energy that you have when it goes back past its initial position on its way back, all of that energy came from that pushing of the cart with the force of F. And so we're going to do this, this where we go from the initial position back to the initial position. And what we can say is that our change in kinetic energy is going to be equal to the work that we've applied. Right? We applied this force of F through that distance and all of that work then turns into, at some point after it goes through the other changes, it comes back into this kinetic energy as it passes its initial position. The reason I can do this is I look at it and I say there are no other forces that are putting work on the system. There's no other energy being added or removed from the system. It's all the other energy is just changing form from one thing to another, okay? All right, so what that tells me then is that 36 joules is equal to F times 10 centimeters. And I'll take that and multiply it by a meter per 100 centimeters. But what else should I add here? is my F in the direction of D? It is not, okay? So I probably should maybe do a, a quick little drawing over here. What I really have is I've got vertical, I've got horizontal, I've got the direction of the slope, which is at this eight degrees. I've got this other direction of the force that was at 40 degrees relative to vertical, right? What I need to know is what is this angle right here? Right? Because if I know that angle, I can multiply by the cosine of that angle to get the component of the force that's acting in the direction of the motion, right? That's what we had at the very beginning of our talk as we said, the you know, the force has to be, you have to take the component of the force that's actually acting in the direction of the motion, and that's the work that is being applied. So, um, given the fact that this entire thing is 90, I would basically say 8 degrees plus whatever this theta is right here, or maybe I'll call it phi because we've already talked about theta in terms of the motion of the wheel. Let's call that phi. Um, you know, 8 plus phi plus 40 is going to be equal to 90 degrees, right? Or we could say 90 degrees minus 40 minus 8 gives us that phi. So 90 degrees minus 40 degrees minus 8 degrees is equal to 42 degrees. Okay. So I take this and I multiply it by the cosine of 42 degrees. And I do that so that I get the component of the force that's acting in the direction of the motion. And, and that way I'm, I'm uh, multiplying uh, the correct amount of force by that amount of motion. All right, and if I solve that for F, it gives me how much, you know, what the magnitude needs to be of that force. Okay, so 36 is equal to x times uh, 10 
divided by 100 times the cosine of 42. And that gives me 484.43. And that would be in Newtons. Which in case, since Newton isn't a super familiar unit to a lot of us, um, it's a little bit more than 100 pounds. All right, so that's part B. We got the magnitude of force F needed so that we achieve that maximum backward distance that we need so that it you know, comes back forward and gives us that two meter per second when it goes back past its starting position. Questions yet about that? You know, the real big thing, that the part that you have to spend all your time doing is make sure that you have accurate description of the states that you're thinking about. So you make sure you got, you think about I'm going from this state to this state and you think about all the different types of energy you have at both of those states and then you have to look at how much work was applied between those two states. All right. All right, so now we go back to C. Part C. Okay, I have a question. All right. Just because that's what it says that you do. It says up here, your constant force is suddenly applied to the cart to push it down the slope. And then that force is suddenly released after the cart moves a distance of 10 centimeters. So how does it get from that 16? What I'm saying is you, you push it through those 10 centimeters. Now, once you've pushed it through those 10 centimeters, it now has uh, some tension in the spring that has a, you know, some, some torsion in the spring that has built up. It has gone down the slope little ways and it has kinetic energy. It has a velocity downward because you've been pushing on it downward. Right? So There's, it's like that's the most that spring will get in here and they keep Yeah, so and imagine, you know, let's say I push on something that's spring loaded that also has mass. I push on it and then I stop pushing on it. Right? Well, because I pushed on it and gave it a velocity, it's not going to immediately stop as soon as I stop pushing on it. It's going to have inertia that carries a little bit further, and then it's going to keep going back the other direction, right? That's what's going on with this problem. You push it a little ways. In that time, it builds up some kinetic energy and, you know, and some inertia going that direction. It, it will wind up the spring some more, and then it'll kind of reverse direction at some point and go back up the uh, slope. Yeah, this thing is massive enough to where when you push on it, it's not like it just immediately stops moving backward when you let go of it. It will keep moving backward, and then it, you know, at some point, the spring will have gotten enough uh, torque in it that it will stop moving, and it'll come back up the, all right? So those are the two distances. We pushed on it for 10 centimeters, but it kept on carrying itself further on for, until it got to 16 centimeters, and then it started going back up the hill. All right, so then the last part, C, um, after that, it now wants to go keep going up the hill until it hits the bumper, right? It's the bumper spring up at the top of the hill. And what we want to know is how much does it compress that bumper spring once it makes it back up the hill? Well, here's the nice thing. We know the amount of kinetic energy that we start with, right? It's 36 joules of, of energy that we're starting with. That 36 joules of energy is going to go into rolling that cart further up the hill, and then at some point it'll hit the spring, and some of the energy will go into compressing that spring, the, the compression spring that we have up there, the bumper spring. Okay, So here's what we have. We're going to have a change in kinetic energy. Oh. Okay. Are we going to have a change in elastic energy? This is, might be a tricky question. No. Okay, it's a good answer. Um, no, why not? Because the spring and the wheel has already been released fully. 
Right. Okay. All right. Perfect answer. So um, we are not dealing with elastic energy from the torsion spring because the one-way clutch has now released and it's, you know, so it's out of the picture now. Your, your torsion spring is no longer acting. But we will have an ela a, uh, elastic energy because of the bumper spring. All right? So I have to put that in here. Okay, what else? What other kind of energy change might I have? It's going up the hill too, right? So I have, so a delta energy due to gravity. All right, so we have a kinetic, elastic, and gravitational energy. Um, do we have any work? during this phase of the problem. So maybe I should write that over here. We're going from um, the, you know, the point where cart passes original position to the maximum deflection of the bumper spring. Okay, so the question is, do I have any work in that phase of the problem? In other words, I'm gonna take a snapshot at the point after it has moved down and it's moving back up now. So right there where it passes its original position this is my starting point, and I'm going to the point where it is uh, has fully compressed the bumper spring as far as it is going to. Okay, um, we wouldn't count that as work because we're basically storing energy in that spring. We don't have some outside force that's coming in and you know and adding or subtracting energy. Okay, we're we're basically accounting for that with this delta E elastic right here. So if we like uh, you can see that red force right there. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the only phase of the problem where we actually did work was when we first put that energy in. Um, so now we don't have any work, so we just go ahead and say this is all going to be equal to zero. Okay. So now, first question is, what is my change in kinetic energy from the point where the cart passes the original position to the maximum deflection of the bumper spring? How much do I change kinetic energy? Okay, well I go from 36 joules of kinetic energy as it's passing that point, that was my first calculation I did basically, right? From that to what? How much kinetic energy do I have at the end? When I reach maximum deflection of the bumper spring, what is the speed of my cart? Okay, I think I, some of you are, are, are saying it, I think. You're just too scared to say it out loud. It's zero, right? It moved up the hill. Whenever it reaches its maximum deflection of that bumper spring, we're back to zero velocity, which means zero kinetic energy. So we're starting with 36 joules of kinetic energy. We're ending with zero. And that means that we have a change of negative 36 joules. So we're going from having 36 to having none. Okay, so that's my kinetic term plus what? Okay, my change in elastic energy is purely due to the deflection of the bumper spring. Okay, and so that's going to be one half of the spring constant for the bumper spring, which is 400 newtons per meter. Okay. And my bumper spring starts with zero energy in it. Okay. So it's going from zero to 
having whatever is stored in it whenever it deflects, that's going to be based on what that delta value is squared, which is what we're trying to solve for. All right, now what about my gravity? Okay, we're going from zero, basically, gravitational energy, because I'm counting that as my zero point, right? My starting position is my zero point for gravity. So I'm going from zero to some height um, that is above where I started out, okay? So that would be positive. MGH, right? So M is just 13 kilograms. G is 9.81 meter per second squared. The height change is going to be whatever my overall distance traveled is times the sine of eight degrees, okay? So the amount of distance I travel is two meters plus however much distance I travel as the spring compresses. Right? The total amount of travel that it does is that it covers that two meters, plus it covers however much more happens when it compresses that um, bumper spring. Okay? And all that is equal to zero. So when I punch all of that in, say I start with negative 36 plus 0.5 times. Uh, that just times 400 times x squared <clears throat> plus 13 times 9.81 times 2 plus x times the sine of eight degrees equals zero. Okay. So this tells me I've got 0 0.02257. Okay, and this would be in meters or this would be, what would that be, 2.257 centimeters. All right. And that's how much maximum bumper deflection that she would have there. Any questions? Two questions. You don't. You don't know that. What would happen, so the question is, how do you know that the car will even make, it will even cover those two meters to make it back up to the spring? The answer is you don't know, okay? What mathematically would you anticipate would happen here if, uh, if it didn't cover that distance? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you could, you'd probably see something weird happen, like maybe you'd calculate a negative value for delta, perhaps. Right, um, that would be something that I could anticipate happening. Right, or it, you know, sometimes if you have uh, a square in there, you know, not maybe not for this problem, but if you have a square term in there, um, it might not allow you to have a negative value where it should, and it would end up giving you a, a complex number. Right, it might give you an I in there somewhere in order to be able to get the number to where it needed to be. Like if you end up doing this problem and it's set and you have a, you know, x squared equals to negative 14, right? 
Well, then the only way that can happen is if X has a, an imaginary number in it, right? So those kinds of things happen. Things, mathematically, something will probably not make sense if you do the calculation and, and um, it doesn't give you what you want. Like if it, if it, you do the calculation based on a particular presumption, if that presumption doesn't happen, it a lot of times leaves you with a problem. Now, having said all of that, you could easily do a, an initial calculation where you figure out what is the uh, energy associated with moving up the slope two meters, right? And as long as that amount of energy is less than 36 uh, joules, then it means you have a little bit more energy that's gonna have to go into the bumper, okay. right? If you wanna really make sure you could do that much of the problem and say, what if I only went up two meters uh, what is my change in gravitational uh, energy by moving up the slope two meters, and you take the difference between that and 36 joules, the rest of it's going to go into, wow. right, yep. And then, uh, yeah. Friction. friction is almost always counted as a work term, okay? Um, so friction Friction is lost energy. So that just pulls the wheels into the surface of whatever it's rolling Yeah, so let's say you, you, any time this thing was moving, there was a constant force against the direction it was moving, right? You would have to add that in as a work term. And, you know, you, generally what you would have to do is then split the problem up into any time the thing changed direction. And you'd have to evaluate you know, like if, if it's moving down the slope, the force due to friction is going to resist the direction of motion when it's moving down the slope. And as soon as it reverses direction, starts going up the slope, the direction that of that friction is going to reverse direction, and you have to go back up the slope. So anytime you have something like that, it is important for you to evaluate up to the point where it changes direction, and then do a second evaluation from that point after that, right, because it actually changes the direction of one of your forces and, um, you know, in other words, you can't just do something continuous through all of that. Um, if you had quick, yeah, as, if you know the total distance it travels, right, and you know that it's a constant force resisting it that whole direction or that whole path, right? Then all you do is you take the total amount of distance traveled multiplied by the amount of frictional force that's resisting it, and that gives you how much work went into that friction. Does that make sense? We'll do, um, I'll tell you what, my, my plan for next time we meet is that we'll cover more uh, examples, and I'll do one of my examples that has friction in it, and that way you can kind of see how to deal with friction. Friction is one of the most complicated things that goes into these problems, so I decided to do this one without it initially, and then we'll... No, friction's important. Friction's important, but it's, uh, you know, we'll get into it, I promise. <laughs>